Hey everyone, this is Deviants Lecture 2, and this one we're talking about more murder. So, uh, in this one we're going to talk about serial killers and mass murderers, uh, murder-adjacent phenomena. In addition, we're going to be talking about social responses to killing. Content warnings should be pretty obvious in this one. We're talking about mass murder murders, but also, uh, for those of us who uh, have been in academia for a while and those of you who grew up really post 2000 uh, we're also going to be talking about active shooters which is a intensely uh, bad problem in our society so uh, serial murder uh, involves killing of a number of people one at a time so you're killing and the magic number here is three uh, three individuals on in all likelihood, depending on how you splice it out, three separate occasions. Uh, most people, most serial killers, serial murderers, uh, murder in one city, and they plan out what they do, they stalk their victims, and they lure them into traps. That's basically the modus operandi, the MO, the way that murderers do it. Serial killers often suffered some kind of abuse while they were children, and they cannot feel remorse for hurting others. Uh, so, um, and the textbook alludes to this, we've already talked about this a little bit. Uh, serial murder, serial killers are kind of profilable, but not as profilable as media leads us to believe. Uh, serial killers tend to follow very specific personalized procedures. I already talked about, I said that a second ago, modus operandi, that get refined over time. Serial killers are very rare. Um, that is another misconception. They're not common. They're, they're really the extreme outliers of human behavior. Most people who get murdered uh, do not get murdered by serial killers, if that's any comfort to you. And uh, it is likely uh, that many serial killers don't actually get caught. Uh, media has a huge impact on the study of both criminology and deviance. Uh, this is especially problematic relating to studying serial killers. Uh, some of that is good because it encourages funding, it encourages more people to study the thing, etc. However, uh, some of it is bad too because writers of television shows, movies, podcasts, whatever, do have a tendency to place greater influence or stress on entertainment as opposed to facts. Uh, and thus people start to believe some things that aren't actually true about uh, serial killers, murderers, the whole, the whole gamut. These are a couple of things that bother me in particular. Uh, most deaths are not investigated. This is a common misconception about not only serial killers, but just like people that die in general. And most murderers, most murders are not obvious. Um, they, uh, most, I'm sorry, I said that wrong. Most murders are obvious. And most people that kill people admit quickly or it goes unsolved. Uh, I had a professor in grad school that said it this way, most murderers that are, are just basically, someone comes in and says, yeah, I killed the bastard, I'm turning myself in. That's how most murders get solved, actually. Uh, another pet peeve, serial killers are not sexy um, by any stretch of the imagination. Most of them are gross, socially inept, and the reason I feel comfortable calling them gross and socially inept is that they're terrible human beings. They're reprehensible in every scope of the imagination, even though media has a tendency to portray them as being sexy and, or interesting or in some way. BTK, one of the most notorious ser serial killers of the 20th century, was an absolute piece of human garbage. Uh, DNA evidence is often not definitive. Uh, this is a common misconception. Uh, you tell me, looking at this uh, piece of DNA evidence in front of you, does that make any sense to you? Even if you are, and some of you, there, statistically, there's probably a couple of you that have studied this, actually. 
uh, and you actually might know what I'm talking about. Uh, I believe this is a PCR test. Um, it's just not as clear cut, open and shut with DNA as we're commonly led to believe. Um, yeah, I mean, DNA evidence is important, but it's, it's not absolutely everything. Uh, the archetype of the criminal profiler is very prevalent in popular culture, and profilers do for sure exist, but their abilities are often exaggerated. Uh, so, put, put it this way, most serial killers do seem like ordinary people. They may even seem timid or shy. So, in the... 70s and 80s, before the public generally had an understanding of serial killers, uh, it was common in post uh, interviews after the person's find out, people said, well, I never would have thought it was him. He was real quiet and always a nice guy. Um, that's, uh, that's how serial killers often appear. Uh, serial killers are typically blue collar workers. Uh, for example, Jeffrey Dahmer dropped out of college. He actually did go to Ohio State for a little bit uh, and worked in a chocolate factory. Uh, that is all about Jeffrey Dahmer. Uh, serial killers are usually white men in their late 20s or early 30s and are typically motivated by an intense power, an intense desire for power over individuals and uh, sadism, the, wanting to inflict pain on other people. Uh, that's not to put, there are some um, sexual fantasies related to sadism as well. That is not to shame those things, as long as they're done in a healthy, consensual way. Uh, but um, this slide basically is to show that, yes, you can profile uh, serial killers, but um, it's, it's just not quite what media portrays it as. Another misconception surrounding serial killers is what's called the McDonald Triad. It was developed in the year 1961, and it is based on the idea that the combination of these three factors would drive an individual to serial killing. So those three factors of the McDonald Triad are cruelty to animals, especially in childhood. So if you just killed a dog or murdered a duck or something like that, then uh, that's something that could put you at risk of serial killing. Uh, fire setting, and we're not talking about like one-off instances, we're talking about like kind of compulsive stuff. And then uresis, which is bedwetting. Uh, so if so, the thought there being that uh, bedwetting, especially prolonged bedwetting to the age of maybe 9, 10, 11, 12, uh, that causes psychological trauma to the individual. However, all of these things, especially actually the bedwetting thing, is really wildly out of date. This concept was actually developed by um, detectives, uh, police officers that were probably relatively well-meaning but uneducated in social science. They basically just put these three things together. They portrayed this as being the thing, but there wasn't sound scientific data to back it up. Basically, the whole thing of it was it sounded good and it sounded convincing. However, it makes for a really good plot, right? Uh, you go through, the detective says, uh-oh, we have the McDonald triad here. What's that? animal cruelty, fire setting, and bedwetting, and then that sets and a stat. It works in terms of telling a narrative. It doesn't actually work in terms of real social science. That's the problem there. Um, so basically, the, the short to this is the McDonald triad is bullshit, but yeah, whatever. So moving on to mass murder. Mass murder is a very different behavior from serial killing. Uh, so we define mass murder as killing of three or more people at about the same time and place. It can be three or more people in all the same, like within like 200 yards of each other, or even all the same room. Uh, or it can be, I kill one person here, 
I go out of my house, I kill two more people, I drive down the street, I kill three more people, uh, that often, that situation uh, where it kind of tends to move tends to be labeled more as spree murder, but the term mass murder and spree murder are basically the same term. Mass murderers do usually die by their own hands or the hands of police. Uh, one especially problematic aspect of that is if the uh, mass murderer is white, which the majority of them tend to be, uh, not always, uh, if they are white, they're more likely to survive the police standoff. If they are uh, people of color, they tend to be killed, um, as we see with other trends and interactions uh, with law enforcement. Um, serial killers are far more elusive. That isn't because the serial killer is smarter. It is because the behavior is more secretive, right? If I have an AR-15 and I'm shooting people all down the block, it's really easy to see me, basically. If I'm stabbing people in their throat and driving them into my basement, it's a little less obvious. Um, uh, it's a matter of strategy, and it's the difference between uh, basically the operating of how the thing works. It's quite frankly, serial killing's just quieter. Uh, ser mass murderers uh, in their own minds even if they don't necessarily survive to express this, uh, tend to externalize responsibility. Uh, so in, in a variety of ways, they tend to fall in one of these three categories. Uh, they feel that they are uh, extraordinarily ordinary, or we can classify them as being extraordinarily ordinary. So the killer thinks that they are super smart or super special. Uh, if they're especially delusional, they may think that they are on some kind of, like, mission from God, or they're being driven by supernatural forces, even though they aren't, right? They could be a disgruntled employee, uh, so the killer wants revenge on, they hate their job, so they go in and they kill all their co-workers. They hate their classmates, so they go in and they kill all their classmates. This actually ties in, we'll talk about this a little bit later. Um, don't think though, with the disgruntled employee subtype, that, well, he was a victim of bullying, so therefore he will go become a serial killer. Uh, there is there's really no evidence to show that bullying makes people um, more likely to hurt people. Um, it's there just isn't a connection there. That was a thought for a long time, and it has been picked up by media and stereotypes, whatever. But there's there's no evidence there. Uh, and then the pseudo commando uh, mass murderer, uh, the killer has a desire to act out military type fantasies, um, and they get they get body armor and they they get the the big gun and they do these kinds of things. Um, there is, again, tied in with kind of stereotypes of mass murderers. Sometimes people say, well, the way you got to be a pseudo-commando was playing all kinds of violent video games. Similarly, there is no uh, correlation there uh, between video games and mass murder. It's, it's an idea that people had, but there is not evidence to back it up. Now, in stark contrast to serial killers, uh, which, as I alluded to, can be profiled, maybe not as much as the media wants us to believe, uh, mass murderers are very difficult to profile. Um, there are three things that, three patterns that we do see, though. Uh, mass murderers do tend to be white. Uh, they do tend to be male. I would say that uh, in terms of mass murderers, uh, they tend to be white. They are almost exclusively male, and that has to do with gender in our society, largely. Um, and the overwhelming consistency and commonality is access to high-capacity firearms. Um, all things separate, all political divisions aside, uh, 
um, it there is a very strong connection between high capacity firearms and uh, mass murder. Uh, this isn't just necessarily like demonizing the AR-15 rifle. It's demonizing really any assault rifle that has a really high capacity bullet um, load. It holds a lot of bullets, basically. Um, that's tied in with the whole concept. Uh, so to take this into perspective, the Columbine shooters, were, which are really thought of being the first of the the modern era of mass murder. There was mass murder before Columbine, but that really changed the the the, the game, I guess, if you want to use that term. Um, they used Tech 9 machine pistols. Uh, so when, at the time of Columbine, there was a, an assault rifle ban in place in the United States where AR-15 type assault rifles were illegal. I believe AK-47s were also illegal at that time. There were there were a lot of uh, assault rifles that you could not legally get in the United States. So uh, the Columbine shooters modified uh, Tech-9 uh, machine pistols, which are smaller guns, but and they have a smaller capacity than say an AR-15, but they they could fire a bunch of bullets, right? As a result, Columbine actually had a significantly less uh, death count than a lot of the more recent um, mass murder situations. I believe it was in the double digits. I don't remember exactly. It was in the double digits. But it was um, basically the, the more bullets that a, a gun can fire, the more people that can be killed. Before the modern era... Uh, before people had um, these kinds of bullet guns that could fire a bunch of bullets, mass murder tend to look like bombings, right? Because a bomb can kill a whole lot more than a gun actually can. Um, but if you look at the data of when that assault rifle ban ended and the uh, mass murder trajectory uh, that it, it definitely went up. Does that mean that everyone with an AR-15 is going to murder people? It doesn't, but the availability of AR-15s for people who can um, do want to do those things, does it, there is a relationship there. Now let's look at murder-adjacent phenomena. Uh, these are behaviors that um, might look like murder, might be related to murder, but aren't actually murder, either because they don't necessarily lead to murder or because it's not exactly murder. So stalking. This is the act of pursuing someone that creates the fear of being assaulted, uh, and that would include rape or being killed. Most stalkers do not perceive themselves as being stalkers. Uh, that speaks to a lot of problematic elements in our society, including but not limited to, um, uh, I'm sorry, I lost my thread, including but not limited to, oh, uh, toxic masculinity, basically. Guys think that a certain be behavior is romantic, while in reality it may be stalking. Uh, most stalkers know their victims, and when we say no, we don't mean actually are close with them, but they know about their victims, they've seen their victims, maybe they are in a, the same class, maybe they, uh, the stalker goes to a certain sub shop and uh, falls in love with the girl behind the counter, something like that. And you can pretty safely um, use gendered wording here, not always, but most cases are men stalking women. That's what it often looks like. There are no racial differences in terms of stalking behavior, uh, which is intriguing and interesting. Most stalkers are white, but again, most people in society are white. Uh, additionally, this behavior may be fading, which is good, uh, because, and it may have been reinforced, uh, during the 80s and 90s and early 2000s because there were many pop culture images of stalking behavior being seen as romantic 
while in reality it was quite dangerous. Uh, there's this uh, a primo case in point. There was a movie called Say Anything in the, I believe, late 80s, maybe early 90s, where uh, the uh, lead character just kept following this girl that did not express interest in him. And then toward the end of the movie, he stands outside her window and plays music on a boombox real loud, thinking that she'll fall in love with him. And then she actually does. That's that's something a stalker would do. His behavior is stalking behavior. And we see this type of behavior kind of reinforced over time. Um, it, it's 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 not romantic. It's dangerous. Hate crimes different thing. Uh, 9,000 Americans per year are the victims of hate crimes, and that number probably is um, underreported. African Americans and LGBTQ plus people are the most common victims of hate crimes. Uh, trans teens are especially vulnerable to hate crimes. There's a couple reasonings there. First of all, trans teens are the most likely to be disowned by their families. Thus, they also are the, the, the category of teens that are most likely to be homeless. And homeless people are especially vulnerable to hate crimes, basically because they don't have anywhere to run home to. Uh, and then if you layer um, discrimination upon discrimination, black trans teens are very, very vulnerable to hate crimes. Most hate killers are part of hate groups and many of those are formed inside of prisons. Um, some of the worst gangs, uh, Ar the Aryan Nation being one of them, uh, they, they form in prisons and then they uh, keep going outside of prisons. Uh, but it should uh, be pointed out that not all hate crimes involve murder. Uh, there are a lot of hate crimes uh, that are assault, that are rape, uh, which are who's to, who's to say rape is better or worse than murder it's it's a different horrible thing uh, but it it's not necessarily just murder there are three general types of hate killers just like there are three general types of uh, mass murderers there are thrill hate killers who kill for the thrill of it because they think they can get away with killing a member of the stigmatized group um, so certainly in the South, uh, in the 1930s, uh, people thought they could just kill black people and get away with it, and that was probably true. Uh, in the early 2000s, we saw a string of teens assaulting or killing homeless people. Uh, that similarly would classify as thrill hate killing. Defensive hate killers, uh, this is either due to a misperceived, uh, misperceiving the victim as personally dangerous or the individual perceives themselves as uh, protecting their territory from outsiders. Uh, we see this in the case of the murder of Trayvon Martin, who was a young black man who was killed by a reprehensible individual who I will not name uh, that uh, was in the murderous individual's neighborhood and that person thought that he was protecting his neighborhood. In reality, he just killed a boy. Uh, there, there are also mission hate killers that see themselves part of a larger movement to quote unquote promote racial purity. Uh, those mission hate killers are the ones most likely to be tied in with uh, hate groups such as the Ku Klux Klan, such as Aryan Nation, such as the Proud Boys, etc. And now let's talk about some social responses to killing. Uh, there are many ways that society responds to violent incidents uh, that contribute to the construction of how we stigmatize uh, outsiders and distract us from actually solving our problems. Uh, this may result from the creation of what we call moral panics and folk devils. Folk devil is a concept related to moral panics. It probably should be um, emboldened on this uh, slide if you're taking notes like that. The definition of a moral panic is a macro scale disproportionate threat uh, response to a threat that is later seen as being an overreaction. 
Uh, there are many examples of these in American society. There was a moral panic in the 1950s surrounding comic books. People thought that comic books were going to make uh, kids murderous and degenerate. Uh, there was a moral panic in the 1990s surrounding rap music. Similarly, people thought that uh, artists like uh, Ice Cube and Dr. Dre were going to encourage young people to become uh, murderous individuals and um, etc. Folk devils then, relating to mass moral panics, are the embodiment of evil or a problem. Thus, uh, it could be an individual, a group, a subculture, a uh, counterculture. The, they're the perpetrator of the moral panic. So uh, we can see this in the folk devil of the dangerous loner. The dangerous loner is seen as an individual who always dresses in black, might wear a trench coat, sits in their basement because they live with their parents and they're always playing vi violent video games, etc. Right? That's kind of that folk devil, and we uh, attribute that folk devil as being the perpetrator of mass murders. And absolutely, mass murders, school shootings, etc. are a very real problem, but the moral panic surrounding dangerous loners is not founded. So after the Columbine massacre, for example, a narrative started blaming bullying victims who were interested in heavy metal music and violent video games. The fact of the matter is that the Columbine killers were actually moderately popular bullies themselves. They were not actually bullied. And this narrative uh, also resulted in the harassment of teens who were already marginalized. I've heard many stories from people that say, yeah, I was a loner, and because I was a loner, like, uh, guidance counselors came after me and wouldn't stop harassing me. That's, that's what it looked like in a lot of high schools. Um, and there's the Doom video game, which I actually played quite a bit of when I was a kid. Uh, this was really pointed to as being the inspiration for Columbine. By modern video game standards, it's honestly almost quaint. Uh, additionally, uh, Marilyn Manson, uh, I'm guessing you know who he was, is? Uh, now, Marilyn Manson definitely is kind of a gross individual in terms of uh, sexual harassment, but um, he, his music, even though it's very dark, is, is not to blame for mass murder. It's just something that people grabbed onto. Uh, moral panics can be escalated by what we call the Iron Quadrangle, which are the four primary social groupings that work together to promote an interest in some troubling element in mutually reinforcing ways. So this can be media, government, so-called experts being in medical, law enforcement, etc. And these experts provide data uh, that may be faulty, depending on the specific moral panic. It should al you should always take into consideration with social scientific research studies, who are the people that benefit and are doing this research, right? Most researchers are uh, absolutely uh, straight up individuals who want to contribute to public knowledge, right? But there are people who are motivated by self-interest and just want to sell something uh, in that way. So the fake experts provide information to activists or a media and all of them get very upset uh, and let government officials know and then laws are passed and the moral panic perpetuates and perpetuates and perpetuates effectively. These groups intersect and interact to determine what kind of activity or specific act is considered deviant. We see examples here in this picture. Uh, there is a honestly comical uh, image of uh, former vice president, presidential nominee, Joe Lieberman, uh, trying to convince everyone that a uh, blue pistol accessory to a video game is what is the cause of violence, I guess. 
uh, the, and then, I mean, this is the kind of infographic you would see on the news today. Link between teen killers and video games. All were big gamers. Well, how do you define big gamer? What game were they all playing? How many mass killers were not, uh, were not big gamers? How many mass murderers were not teens, right? Uh, in the reality of the matter is that there isn't a connection between the two. Now, there is a certain connection between very violent media, including video games, and certain antisocial behaviors, but there isn't that connection with uh, murder itself. Okay, um, that is it for uh, this lecture. Uh, you have any questions? Just let me know.